honour to welcome you to Hamburg this morning. As one of the co-organisers of this international conference, I'm delighted to see that leading law of the sea experts, policymakers and practitioners were in the position to accept our invitations and that so many participants with very different backgrounds, practitioners, members of academia, alumni of the International Foundation for the Law of the Sea's annual Summer Academy and students have registered for this event. The International Law of the Sea as one of the oldest and I'd say particularly important areas of general public international law continues to gain momentum, not only in the relevant community, but also in its external perception. The very high number of participants also evidences the relevance of the free and Hanseatic city of Hamburg as a truly maritime location, both from a practical and academic perspective, as one of Europe's most important ports, and of course, as the seat of the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea. And let me use this opportunity to extend the gratitude of all conference organizers to President Jin Jun Peck that this event could take place not only in the premises of the tribunal, but here, even in the main courtroom, which is undoubtedly one of the most suitable and attractive venues, if I may use these words, for holding a conference on exactly the international law of the sea. Thank you very much, Mr. President. This international conference is an academic event organized for the sake of common interest. It is held in order to celebrate the almost, not really, but almost 25th anniversary of the entry into force of the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea on the 16th of November, 1994. One of the most complex international treaties ever negotiated and thus, thus often labeled the Constitution for the Oceans, it remains the fundamental basis for governing the world's oceans. Keeping in mind that it took almost 12 years for the Convention to enter into force following its conclusion in 1982, it must be borne in mind, however, that it reflects political and diplomatic realities as well as the state of knowledge of marine sciences of a period some 40 years ago. Against this background, and perhaps unsurprisingly, an array of contemporary challenges is testing some of the Convention's key provisions, principles, and institutions. These challenges include, and this is not an exhaustive list, first, the general suitability and effectiveness of the regime established by the Convention in relation to issues such as global warming, sea level rise, illegal unreported and unregulated fishing, ocean acidification and maritime terrorism, to mention just a few, which were at least not at the forefront when the Convention was signed in 1982. Secondly, the current negotiations of an international legally binding instrument for the conservation of biological diversity in areas beyond national jurisdiction. This was the short version, as you know. I never get out the proper name in full. Thirdly, the peaceful settlement of dispute under the international law of the sea. This is exactly the uh, venue we are here that is the most prominent body in this respect. The relevance of technology development on ocean governance. And last but not least, the fact that worldwide ocean users as well as land-based economic activities have reached a level that is threatening the integrity and healthiness of the marine environment on which mankind so heavily depends. While these challenges require that subsequent alterations and refinements of the convention made by way of academic, judicial and diplomatic representations are being paid specific attention, they do, in my opinion, not alter the fact that a common legal basis is needed that provides us with a comprehensive and integral chart to govern and steer the oceans. The Law of the Sea Convention is the only legal document available that establishes the necessary comprehensive regime and safeguards predictability. And I share the widespread belief that the Convention has the potential to develop into an even more flexible, yet resilient and integral legal architecture. In light of this, the overall objective of this conference is to reconfirm the integrity, comprehensiveness and resilience of the Law of the Sea Convention in the midst of a variety of the challenges I mentioned before. We believe that the 25th anniversary of the entry into force of this treaty marks the appropriate point in time for reassessing from the perspective of international legal scholarship and policymaking and 
the practitioner's perspective, the regime which has been and still is so strongly influenced by the terms of the Convention. Allow me to um, end with some remarks on the structure of this conference. It consists, as you can see from the conference program, of five panels that will address some of the challenges which I referred to before, and three keynote speeches. I'm particularly pleased that it was possible to attract three highly respected and in influential speakers from different fields to deliver the keynote speeches. These speakers are the former US Secretary of Defense, Chuck Hagel, the former President and Prime Minister of Timor-Leste, Kairala Shenana Guzmao, and the President of the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, Jintun Pek. A warm welcome to Hamburg to you. As far as the five sessions are concerned, the purpose of the conference is less to have formal academic papers presented, but to engage in a debate on the topics of the individual panels. The main emphasis shall thus be on the discussion between the panelists, as well as between the panelists and the conference participants. To this aim, the speakers were asked to develop their thoughts on issues which they regard as being particularly important, and to give comparatively brief input statements of 15 to maximum 20 minutes. We are going to establish a very strict regime on this. Uh, this will remind you of the Jessup International Mood Court competition, which means a person is sitting in this room that is going to show signs to you. And if the sign one minute has been shown to you one minute ago, this essentially means come to an end, please. Because if that doesn't happen, we don't have enough time to discuss. For the debate which follows this, microphones are available in the room and they will be carried to you and organized by the moderators of the session. Now, thank you once again um, for coming to Hamburg, for registering for this conference, and thank, let me use this opportunity and thank my fellow friends and colleagues from uh, the Hamilton Luger School, as well as the IFLOS, the co-organizers of this event, for, I think, the wonderful, excellent cooperation in preparing this and for the spirit of commitment and friendship that we all um, felt when organizing this. Without further ado, let me then please introduce you our first keynote speaker, although I tend to say that it is not even necessary to introduce the keynote speaker. It is President Jin Hyun Pek. He has been a judge of the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea since 2009 and was elected as President of the Tribunal in October 2017 for a term of three years. He is currently also arbitrator in the Enrica Lex, Lexi incident and president of the arbitral tribunal in the dispute concerning coastal state rights in the Black Sea, the Sea of Azov and the Strait of Kerch. Uh, president Peck is professor of international law at the Seoul National University in Korea and he was dean of its graduate school in international studies for a long period of time. No need to mention all the relevant publications that most of you will be aware of. President Peck, it's a particular honor that you are here and give the first keynote. The floor is yours. Thanks very much. Thank you, uh, Professor Perth, for a kind invitation. Guten Morgen, distinguished participants, dear colleagues, and ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I want to welcome you all today to the premises of the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea. I also want to thank the Hamilton Luga School of Global and International Studies at Indiana University, Bloomington, and the University of Hamburg for their initiative to organize this conference and for inviting me to give a keynote speech. In this morning's speech, I will focus on the role of my tribunal in the settlement of disputes related to the law of sea and its contribution to the development of international law. As Professor Press mentioned in his opening remark, which place could be better suited for such endeavor than the tribunal's courtroom. Dear colleagues, I cannot begin my remarks on the 
it close without saying a few words about UN Convention on the Law of Sea itself, as the tribunal is a product of the UNCLOS and constitutes an integral part of its dispute settlement system. Such words may also be called for in light of the theme of this conference, how healthy is the ocean's constitution. 25 years after the entry into force of the convention, and 37 years after its adoption, it is my assessment that the legal regime created by the convention has worked fairly well in promoting the rule of law at the sea. The convention has almost achieved universality with 168 states parties so far. Two additional implementing agreements have been adopted and the third one is currently under negotiation. Maybe tomorrow you will hear the progress of negotiation from the president of intergovernmental conference. The UNCLOS regime is stable yet flexible enough to accommodate necessary changes. This does not mean that there is no problem, challenge, or practice that deviates from the provisions of the Convention. There are many. However, the Convention has been successful in creating the expectation among states that the rule of law exists and works in the world's ocean and that justice can be done for all states, big or small, strong or weak, and developed or developing. The comprehensive system of dispute settlement of the Convention, one of the major achievements of the third UN Conference on the Law of Sea, has played a key role in this regard. Perhaps the most emblematic of the rule of law in this regard is that a small state institutes a legal action against a bigger and more powerful state in international courts or tribunals. This frequently happens in this tribunal, at this courtroom, and other courts. Dear colleagues, as you know, ITLOS is one of the four means for the compulsory settlement of disputes under Part 15 of the Convention, which allows states' parties a choice of procedure among ITLOS, ICJ, and two arbitrations. It is not even a so-called default forum. However, this should not underestimate the role of the tribunal. Indeed, the tribunal has a unique character in the convention regime. It is a permanent judicial institution with wide-ranging functions, some of which no other means under Article 287 of the convention can perform. In short, it is irreplaceable in the effective functioning of the legal system created by the Convention. Let me elaborate. The Tribunal, of course, deals with the interstate disputes concerning the interpretation or application of the Convention. No doubt, this contentious jurisdiction is primary role of the Tribunal, but its function goes far beyond this. The tribunal and its seabed dispute chamber can also give advisory opinions. The advisory opinion of the chamber is given at the request of the council or assembly of the International Seabed Authority to assist its work. While the convention does not contain an explicit provision for the advisory opinion of the full tribunal, Article 21 of the Statute of the Tribunal provides that the jurisdiction of the tribunal comprises, I quote, all matters specifically provided for in any other agreement which confers jurisdiction on the tribunal, end of quote. In 2015, based on this provision, the tribunal gave its first advisory opinion to the request submitted by the sub-regional fisheries commissions with respect 
to the flex state responsibility and liability in respect of IUU fishing. In addition, only the tribunal, maybe not in law but in reality, can conduct prompt release proceedings under Article 292 of the Convention, which is instrumental to safeguard the interest of maritime states from the extension of the coastal state jurisdiction under the Convention. Now, let me say a few words about the seabed dispute chamber of the tribunal. This chamber has compulsory and almost exclusive jurisdiction over disputes arising from activities in the area, namely disputes concerning seabed mining activities. In addition, the chamber has competence to, to deal with disputes involving not only states, but also non-state entities, including the International Seabed Authority, the enterprise, and natural and juridical persons. This represents a major innovation in international adjudication. While the chamber's 11 members are selected from among the members of the tribunal, its jurisdiction exists separately from that of the tribunal. For this reason, the chamber is often referred to as a tribunal within the tribunal. When the commercial mining begins, hopefully in the not too distant future, I believe that the chamber with its exclusive and compulsory jurisdiction will be the centerpiece of judicial activities of the tribunal. Dear colleagues, uh, another important role the tribunal plays, which is not widely known, is to facilitate the functioning of an Annex 7 arbitral tribunal. As you know, Annex 7 arbitration is not only one of the four means under Article 287, but a default forum. As such, many disputes have been submitted to arbitration. Therefore, it would serve the interest of states' parties to the Convention to ensure that the Annex 7 arbitration functions effectively. The interaction between the tribunal and the Annex 7 arbitral tribunal takes place in three ways. First, the tribunal may prescribe provisional measures under Article 290, Paragraph 5 of the Convention, pending the constitution of the arbitral tribunal. This is one of the most innovative features of the Law of Sea Convention. As the constitution of the arbitral tribunals, tribunal takes time, there should be an arrangement to take care of the urgent need to preserve the rights of the parties to the dispute pending the constitution of such tribunal. This procedure has frequently been utilized and turns out to be quite useful. Second, when parties to the dispute cannot agree on the appointment of arbitrators within the time limit, it is the president of the tribunal that will appoint arbitrators in accordance with Article 3 of the Annex 7 to the Convention. Strictly speaking, this may not be considered an interaction between the tribunal and Annex 7 arbitral tribunal, as it involves the president of tribunal rather than the tribunal itself. Be that as it may, since one of the most difficult yet crucial parts of arbitration is to compose an arbitral tribunal and parties to the dispute, more, of, more often than not, are unable to agree on the appointment of arbitrators, the appointing authority of the president of the tribunal is essential to the effective functioning of the Annex 7 arbitration. Third, the interaction between the tribunal and Annex 7 arbitration comes not only from the institutional arrangement which I have just mentioned, but from the practice developed over the past two decades. In many Annex 7 arbitration, 
the tribunal's judges have served as arbitrators. This practice has significant advantages in bringing the expertise and experience of the tribunal's judges to the Annex 7 arbitration, and perhaps more importantly, in ensuring the consistent and coherent interpretation of the convention and thus avoiding the fragmentation of jurisprudence. It should be recalled in this regard that one of the most serious concerns about Article 287 of the Convention was the risk of fragmentation in the sense that different forums on the Article 287 could interpret and apply the provisions of the Convention differently. There was extensive debate about such risk in early days after the entry into force of the Convention. However, 25 years later, we no longer hear about it. This was not least due to the fact that ITLOS judges have been closely involved with Annex 7 arbitration. In this regard, I'm aware that there are some concerns about judges of permanent courts, such as ITLOS or ICJ, participating in arbitration as arbitrators. I'm also aware that the ICJ has recently adopted a policy restricting its judges' involvement with state investor arbitration or commercial arbitration. However, it was judges serving as an arbitrator in the Annex 7 arbitration is not comparable to the situation in which judges of international court established to settle dispute between states by applying public international law, serve as arbitrator in state investor arbitration or commercial arbitration. Distinguished participants, dear colleagues, and ladies and gentlemen, let me now turn to the jurisprudence of the tribunal and its contribution to the development of international law. Much has been written and spoken about this subject, and therefore I will not repeat them here. I just want to make a few points. First, the primary function of the tribunal is to settle a specific dispute submitted to it. However, in doing so, the tribunal as a permanent judicial institutions, institution established by the convention is fully aware of and committed to its responsibility to safeguard the integrity of the Convention as a package deal and maintain the fine balance achieved in the Convention. Such institutional commitment to maintain and reinforce the Convention regime makes the Tribunal distinct from ad hoc arbitration whose function is to dispose of disputes before it. Second, the tribunal is also fully aware of the fact that it has no exclusive jurisdiction over disputes concerning the interpretation or application of the convention. In this regard, the tribunal, I want to tell you that the tribunal respects the freedom of states' parties to choose the means they prefer and consequently endeavors to make the system created by the convention to work without increasing a risk of fragmentation. Its jurisprudence shows that it has taken particular care to promote uniformity and coherence of the Convention. However, this does not mean that the tribunal merely follows the jurisprudence established by other court or tribunal. On the contrary, tribunal has not been shy from taking innovative and creative approach to several issues, if necessary and appropriate. The best example in this regard may be the tribunal's decision in the Bay of Bengal case, in which the tribunal followed the well-established jurisprudence on the method of delimitation for the exclusive economic zone and continental shelf within 200 nautical miles, while it broke a new ground by delimiting a boundary for the continental shelf beyond 
200 nautical miles for the first time in the history of maritime boundary delimitation adjudication. This decision is widely acknowledged as a careful balance between continuity and change. Third, one of the major contributions of the tribunal is to bring new types of disputes into the realm of public international law and adjudication. This applies to the disputes related to the arrest and detention of ships and international environmental disputes. Let me explain a little bit. Uh, almost the two-thirds majority of the cases the tribunal has dealt with over the past two decades concern disputes related to the arrest and detention of ships. This stands a stark contrast with the fact that uh, before the entry into force of the convention, few of those disputes have been subject to international adjudication. This may sound a bit surprising in light of the ubiquitous presence of ships at sea. However, it should be noted that there are several intricate legal questions, both substantive and procedure, procedural, they need to be addressed before disputes relating to the arrest and detention of ships are brought before international adjudication. They include the nationality and registration of ships, the concept of genuine link, the applicability of the rule of exhaustion of local remedies, the nationalities the nationality of claims, namely the possibility of the flex state making claims on behalf of persons who are not its national or cargo which does not belong to the flex state, and the nature of injury to a ship to name a few. The tribunal in dealing with disputes relating to the arrest and detention of ships clarified those legal issues and developed important legal doctrines, such as ship as a unit doctrine and doctrine of flex state protection, thereby opening a new door, opening a door for states to bring their disputes to international adjudication. For international environmental disputes, at least five cases the tribunal has dealt with so far entirely or partially concerned the protection and preservation of the marine environment. Again, this stands a stark, uh, again, this stands a contrast with the fact that before 1990s, few international environmental disputes had been submitted to international education, adjudication. This is partly because, despite growing concern about the state of the global environment, and frequent rhetoric on the importance of its protection, doubts had lingered for long about the existence of general international law of environment and the utility of interstate adjudication as a means to resolve international environmental disputes. However, this prevailing skepticism, so to speak, toward international environmental law and international environmental litigation started to dissipate in the 1990s, especially with the ITLOS, together with ICJ, taking a lead in clarifying and developing international environmental law, and thus opening a new chapter for interstate environmental adjudication. The tribunal's finding on the key notion of international environmental law such as precautionary approach, duty to cooperate, environmental impact assessment, and due diligence were crucial in this regard. Fourth, I want to say a word or two about the jurisprudence of tribunal in relation to that of the International Court of Justice. Observers of the jurisprudence of the tribunal may have witnessed an ongoing process of so-called 
cross-fertilization or judicial dialogue between the tribunal and the International Court of Justice. This form of interaction allows international courts and tribunals to draw upon each other's case law and, where appropriate, adopt common approaches. To the extent possible, this fosters the development of consistent jurisprudence, which increases predictability and enhances the confidence of states in the virtues of judicial settlement of international disputes. Both the ITLOS and the ICJ have relied upon the relevant jurisprudence of the respective other body with regard to the application and interpretation of substantive international law, in particular in the fields of maritime delimitation and international environmental law. In addition, however, the tribunal has also been inspired by the jurisprudence of the ICJ relating to procedural issues. In this regard, it is worth recalling that the statute and the rules of the tribunal, while containing significant differences and innovations, are partly modeled on those of the ICJ. Let me, however, also emphasize that, notwithstanding the importance of cross-fertilization between the tribunal and the ICJ, both institutions continue to fulfill distinct mandates. The ICJ is a court of general jurisdiction, which, in accordance with the UN Charter, has been de designated as the principal judicial organ of the United Nations. The ITLOS, on its part, is the global adjudicatory body entrusted with the specific mission of resolving the law of sea disputes between states' parties to the Convention. As the only permanent judicial institution to have been created by the Convention, it has duty to act as the principal judicial guardian of the legal order of oceans created by the Convention. The tribunal is conscious of this role and it has actively exercised its power to safeguard the Convention regime and will continue to do so. Dear colleagues and ladies and gentlemen, in closing, I would like to thank the organizers again for inviting me to address this distinguished audience and for giving me the opportunity to reflect on the role of my tribunal for the settlement of disputes related to the law of sea and its contribution to the development of international law. I look forward to a productive discussion on various issues today and tomorrow. And thank you again for your kind attention. President Peck, thank you so much for your assessment of the tribunal's jurisdiction, but in particular for pointing us to the contribution of the tribunal to the development of international law, which I think is an extremely important one, and I think that your keynote um, established an excellent basis for the debates and discussions that we are have, going to have in the individual panels. Thank you so much. Um, this is the moment where I would like to introduce you to um, Professor Harold Koh, who accepted uh, not only to give um, a presentation, but also to um, serve as the moderator of the first panel entitled, How Healthy is the Unclause? Professor Harold Hongju Ko is Sterling Professor of International Law at Yale Law School, uh, to which he returned in January 2013 after, and that is what Professor Ko is very um, well known for serving for nearly four years as the 22nd legal advisor of the United States Department of State. Without doubt, Professor Ko is one of the United States' leading experts in public and private international law, national security law, and human rights law, and his publications are very well known all over the world. Professor Ko, thanks for being here, um, for accepting the invitation, and I'd like to invite you to 
join me here, moderate the panel, and I would also like to invite the other panelists, please, to sit here and, yes, thank you. We have a PowerPoint for the first presentation, if that could be put up. Mm. Rachel, where's the, where was it? Sorry, I'm, I don't think this is the right one. While this is happening, we're going to order the prompt release of a ship. So Rachel, can I operate that from here? If you want to Thank you. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here and to be chairing this uh, first panel. Uh, we also thank the organizers for uh, this remarkable conference. And um, I should just add to the very generous introduction um, that I do not uh, have an uncle named Tommy. Uh, our task on panel one is to do a kind of medical analysis. How healthy is the UNCLOS regime? And we wanted to establish some metrics to begin. Uh, with regard to the present, the past, and the future. With regard to the present, obviously the question is to what extent are the UNCLOS rules being observed? This is the subject of panel two, practitioners' perspectives. With regard to the past, uh, the obvious question is the success of the various dispute resolution mechanisms. This will be discussed in panel three on ocean jurisprudence and was also part of President Peck's uh, recent uh, uh, excellent keynote speech. Uh, we will focus mainly on the two uh, main producers of jurisprudence, the tribunal and also Annex 7 arbitrations and how they affect both the great powers as well as a novel method of compulsory conciliation on which we'll hear a keynote from His Excellency Shanana Guzmao of Timor-Leste uh, in the early afternoon. And with regard to the future, what is the capacity of this regime to address emerging challenges? This goes both to panel three on technological transformation and panel five on the prospects for a new treaty of biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction. And hopefully this will allow us to give a quick assessment uh, <clears throat> as we begin this conference. On uh, the present, uh, as was stated, there are 168 state parties, 14 states have signed but not ratified. Some key nations who have not signed or ratified, like my own country, nevertheless follow almost all of the rules, almost all of the time as customary international law. There's been a steady resort to the dispute settlement process for both provisional measures and the merits, and there have been reasonable levels of both de jure and de facto compliance 
with the rulings of the dispute settlement mechanisms so that rulings on particular legal issues have promoted political resolution. In the words of Judge Shearer, in the South Bluefin Tuna case, the ITLOS can function as an agent of uh, diplomacy, uh, prodding action. On procedures, the caseload has been relatively small, 28 matters, about one per year, but the speed is impressive, about three weeks for provisional measures, less than 30 months to merits decisions. As you heard, there have been contentious cases as well as advisory opinions, both by the Deep Seabed Dispute Chamber and by the Subregional Fisheries Commission. On substantive issues, we'll hear more on panel three, but there are four main areas, some of which were just highlighted by President Peck. Maritime boundaries, preserving the marine environment, humanitarian concerns, and seized vessels. And I'll just run through these quickly. With regard to maritime boundaries, two very important cases, uh, Ghana Cote d'Ivoire on the maritime boundary in the Atlantic Ocean and the Bay of Bengal case where at the request of the parties, uh, the territorial sea, the uh, EEZ and the continental shelf were all delimited as well as a case just brought to a special chamber by Mauritius and Maldives. On the marine environment, uh, the precautionary principle, as stated in South Bluefin Tuna, Mox plant, which required what Judge Peck just called the duty to cooperate, and the land reclamation case regarding Singapore and Malaysia, in which the measure was directing Singapore not to uh, conduct land reclamation ways that were harmful to the marine environment and to establish information exchange mechanisms to assess, assess the effects of that work. Um, and the deep seabed case, of course, which sets standards for diligence, precaution, best practices, and environmental impact assessments. With regard to humanitarian concerns, the Saiga case uh, showed that the tribunal was not constrained. It noted that considerations of humanity must apply to the law of the sea as in other areas of international law, so that use of force was an issue on which uh, 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 judges could pass uh, in the course of deciding law of the sea issues. On seas vessels, 19 of 28 cases involved seas vessels uh, because of the innovation pointed to by President Peck, where the ITLOS can award provisional measures while disputes proceed under an Article 7 tribunal. The leading case, obviously, the ARA Libertad, which uh, allowed uh, sovereignty concerns to weigh into the release of a warship. This was, a, again, uh, cited just this summer in the three Ukrainian vessels case. Uh, the uh, Kamauko case, which applied a balanced approach so that exhaustion was not strictly required, and again, the Saiga case. Now, most of the other cases, uh, I will just simply uh, mention them here. There are 15 of them. Again, most of them, effective use of the jurisprudence of the tribunal to uh, promote release without regard to um, whether proceedings are going on domestically upon the issuance of a security or some kind of bond. On the <clears throat> question of the jurisprudence, you have both uh, in, in the Permanent Court of Arbitration the typical case, but a key factor, obviously, great powers, how uh, the arbitration panels have responded particularly when P5 members have been at issue, China, Russia, United Kingdom, and France. And we'll hear more about a new method, compulsory conciliation, involving Timor-Leste and Australia. Obviously, the big case, the South China Sea case, which was an extraordinary sweeping ruling, five issues rejecting China's claims under the nine-dash line, saying none of their features was capable of generating an EEZ, pointing to the unlawfulness of Chinese actions by various forms of interference, uh, again, pointing to harm to the marine environment, 
and finally saying that large-scale land reclamation and construction of artificial islands aggravated the dispute. With regard to Russia, here there's a case pending before uh, a, uh, Annex 7 tribunal chaired by President Peck. Uh, it's still under submission. I should disclose I'm one of the counsel for Ukraine. But the arguments are similarly broad, that through a systematic pattern of exclusion, exploitation, and usurpation, Russia is violating Ukraine maritime rights in three vital waterways, excluding Ukrainian civilians and vessels from living and non-living resources, and also interfering with navigation and threatening the marine environment by a campaign of unilateral construction in the Kerch Strait. Again, obviously with the United Kingdom, the Mauritius case held the Chagos Marine Protected Area unlawful. This was an obvious precursor to the ICJ's advisory opinion, which held that the process of decolonization was not lawfully completed and that the US, UK is under an obligation to bring to an end its administration of the Chagos as quickly as possible. So no one can say that the UNCLOS has not hesitated, has hesitated to rule against the great powers. It has taken bold and decisive action. And then we have the compulsory conciliation, Timor-Leste in Australia. You will hear more from uh, uh, President Guzmao. You'll also hear from uh, the, uh, the uh, Permanent Court of Arbitration member who worked hardest uh, to make this possible, Garth Schofield. Recently, a law review article said, despite being the first of its kind, the process has been fast, efficient, and ultimately successful. And then finally, the future. I will only flag the issues. Technology, which is panel four, sea level rise, outer continental shelf and EEZ, renewable energy, gender and the law of the sea, and our current anthropogenic human-influenced era. Uh, one question that my fellow panelists, I hope, will address, do we need a new treaty to address these issues? How successful is the current framework in uh, taking on these problems? And this will then lead us to panel five on biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction, uh, which will um, end the discussion tomorrow. So where we are at, at <coughs> in this medical assessment, with regard to the present, very good observance of rules with regard to the past, quite good, characterized by relative speed and decisiveness, a willingness to adjudicate on actions by great powers, innovating new methods of dispute resolution like compulsory conciliation, and the future, this is to be determined and discussed uh, in the next uh, day and a half. To continue the conversation, um, I have three outstanding panelists. This is the order in which they will speak. First, Gabrielle Getchawanli, the Director of the Division for Ocean Affairs and Law of the Sea at the UN Office of Legal Affairs, who will talk about the health of UNCLOS. Davor Vidas of the Nassen Institute in Norway will talk about Law of the Sea for a new epoch. And then, as I mentioned, Garth Schofield of the Permanent Court of Arbitration will talk about the role of the Permanent Court of Arbitration in both Annex 7 and compulsory conciliation. Thank you, and then with this, let me turn it over to Gabrielle. Good morning. Good morning, distinguished participants, Judge Pike, Judge Haidar. I want to thank at the outset the organizers for this invitation and for the support and of course for, to the tribunal for hosting uh, this conference. Distinguished participants, in 2015, the first World Ocean Assessment highlighted that the world's ocean is facing major pressure simultaneously with such great impacts that the limits of its carrying capacity are being, or in some cases, have been reached. This year, we learned that 65% of the ocean is experiencing cumulative impacts from human activities. Climate change affects our oceans generally, and impacts include accelerated sea level rise, 
more frequent extreme sea level events, an increasing rate of ocean warming and acidification with impacts on species composition, abundance, and biomass production of ecosystems. Communities in small islands and low-lying coastal areas are particularly exposed to these changes and the risks associated with sea level rise. Therefore, 25 years after the entry into force of the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, UNCLOS, we are witnessing an alarming and accelerating decline in the health, productivity and resilience of our ocean, resulting from anthropogenic pressures. Given this unhealthy state of the ocean, one may well ask, how healthy is UNCLOS? This question, in turn, raises two interrelated questions. Firstly, is UNCLOS healthy or good for the ocean, and in particular for the conservation and sustainable use of its resources? And secondly, is UNCLOS itself healthy enough to ensure the achievement of that objective? During the commemoration of the 25th anniversary of the entry into force of UNCLOS at the meeting of states parties this year, Delegations emphasized the contribution of the Convention to the strengthening of international peace and security, the governance of maritime spaces, navigational rights and duties, the conservation and sustainable use of ocean resources, and the protection and preservation of the marine environment. Such contribution has also been widely recognized in legal and policy instruments. Thus, for example, in Sustainable Development Goal, SDG 14 of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, where states committed to enhance the conservation and sustainable use of the ocean and its resources by implementing international law as reflected in UNCLOS. Therefore, UNCLOS seems to be regarded by states as healthy or good for the conservation and sustainable use of our ocean. So then, let me turn to the second question. Is UNCLOS itself healthy enough to be able to achieve such conservation and sustainable use? Delegation statements during the commemoration of the 25th anniversary suggest that it is. They underlined the achievement of the Convention as the constitution for the ocean and recalled that it sets out the legal framework within which all activities in the oceans and seas must be carried out. They also stressed the careful balance struck in UNCLOS between the freedoms, rights and obligations of states' parties, as well as among the diverse interests of states. Of note in this regard is how UNCLOS balances the right to economic development with duties for the protection and preservation of the marine environment and the conservation and sustainable management, excuse me, conservation and management of living marine resources. Clearly, the principles contained in UNCLOS have stood the test of time, and most of its provisions are now regarded as constituting customary international law. During the commemoration, the contribution of the Convention to the rule of law through its comprehensive dispute settlement regime was also highlighted. And in this regard, the jurisprudence of the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea relating to the protection of the marine environment, as has been noted this morning, is particularly noteworthy. But UNCLOS has also demonstrated its own dynamism. As a framework instrument, it has proven to be sufficiently flexible to address new concerns and needs, as evidenced by the conclusion of two implementing agreements and the ongoing negotiation on an international legally binding instrument on the conservation and sustainable use of marine biological diversity of areas beyond national jurisdiction. UNCLOS, which itself mandates the further development of its provisions, is today complemented by an array of international legal instruments covering many ocean aspects, including conservation and sustainable use. All these developments constitute positive health indicators for UNCLOS itself and provide a solid basis to conserve and sustainably use the ocean. However, there are other indicators that lead to a diagnosis of serious health issues for which, fortunately, remedies are available, at least for the most part. The first health issue relates to the level of participation in UNCLOS, its implementing agreements and related treaties. 
But here the cure is clear. It lies in universal participation as annually called for by the General Assembly. A second health issue arises from existing gaps with regard to the material or geographical scope of relevant instruments. Here we can look in particular to the UN Fish Stocks Agreement for a cure as it mandates the establishment of new regional fisheries management organizations or arrangements, RFMOAs, where these do not exist and to the resumed review conference as it recommended the expansion of existing RFMOAs of their geographical and or species coverage. A third and more pervasive health issue relates to implementation. While in the absence of a mandate and overall assessment of the implementation of UNCLOS and related treaties has not been carried out, the findings of the first World Ocean Assessment and recent assessments demonstrate that full implementation has not yet been achieved. Recent surveys also indicate that SDG 14 is among the least implemented of the SDGs. The UN Secretary General has emphasized that full implementation of international law as reflected in the Convention is the key means to achieving SDG 14 and other ocean-related targets, and has encouraged all states to become parties to the Convention and to approach the task of its full implementation with renewed commitment and vigor. The reasons for insufficient progress towards full implementation are manifold. They include insufficient intersectoral cooperation and coordination, a policy of short-term economic gains without sufficient consideration of social and environmental factors, slow progress in the implementation of ecosystem approaches and other management tools and precautionary approaches, insufficient capacity and financial resources, overlapping maritime claims, criminal activities at sea, and insufficient international cooperation and coordination. There is no one cure for addressing these challenges. Action is required at all levels, local, national, and international. To begin with, all would benefit from increased awareness of the legal framework. Beyond that, progress towards full implementation is very much dependent on political will, mainstreaming of ocean health and sustainable management into national development plans, putting in place the necessary regulatory and administrative setup to foster integrated ocean management and other actions at the national level. Some of these cures are also dependent on action at the international level, in particular increased cooperation and coordination, including with respect to capacity building. But this raises yet another health issue. Although cooperation has been increasing between and among regional and global bodies, many efforts are limited to specific regions or sectors, leading to gaps and in some cases duplication of efforts and overall insufficient attention paid to cumulative impacts. With an ever-increasing number of processes and outcomes concerning the ocean, now, more than ever, cooperation and coordination at all levels needs to be enhanced. This will not only facilitate greater integration of the legal regimes for land, air, climate, and oceans, and create synergies amongst efforts, but also ensure consistent application and implementation of UNCLOS. Education and knowledge sharing is central in that regard, but coordination at the policy level is also crucial here, the General Assembly, assisted by the open-ended informal consultative process on oceans and the law of the sea, could play a stronger role to ensure that the problems of ocean space are considered as a whole. If adequately mandated, UN Oceans, the interagency mechanism on oceans and coastal issues within the United Nations system, could also support the Assembly, especially in the area of capacity building. Not all states, in particular developing countries, have the required human, institutional, and technological capacities, as well as financing, to fully, fully implement UNCLOS and related legal instruments, raising a health issue which has thus far defied a cure. 
Although a number of capacity building programs exist and financial support is provided bilaterally, the over, overall level of assistance does not match current levels of demand. There, are also no general, um, there is also no general funding mechanism for the ocean and voluntary trust funds are for the most part depleted highlighting not only the importance of finding new and innovative ways of sustainable financing, but also the vital need to strengthen cooperation and coordination. It is also necessary to engage all the, all the relevant stakeholders in the conservation and sustainable use of the ocean and its resources. The current focus on the development of a blue economy provides a very good opportunity to promote the integration of the three pillars of sustainable development and the implementation of management approaches that are informed by the best available science, reinforce integration, cooperation and coordination, and encourage broad stakeholder engagement. In that regard, opportunities for meaningful private sector engagement should be further explored. The high-level 2000 United Nations Conference to support the implementation of SDG 14 in Lisbon next year provides a good particular opportunity for multi-stakeholder engagement, new partnerships and voluntary commitments in support of SDG 14. In closing, I also wish to highlight the important role of this conference. Like the 2020 UN Ocean Conference, it also provides a great venue to underscore why full implementation of UNCLOS and other treaties is critical for the achievement of the conservation and sustainable use of the ocean and its resources, the health of our ocean, and ultimately also the health of UNCLOS. Many thanks to the Indiana University's Hamilton Luger School of Global and International Studies, Universität Hamburg, and the International Foundation for the Law of the Sea for this very good inter initiative. I thank you very much for your attention. Uh, we'll next hear from Garth Schofield of the Permanent Court of Arbitration. Thank you, Harold, and thank you to the Indiana University the University of Hamburg and the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea for the opportunity to speak today. It's a pleasure to be back in Hamburg and amongst so many friends. Now, the health of the convention is a topic that can be approached in many different ways. And I'd like to speak today about two different aspects. First, the role of binding dispute settlement mechanisms in maintaining the health of the convention as a treaty. And second, the role of non-binding mechanisms, including conciliation, in maintaining the health of the binding mechanisms. Now, Harold has already given an overview of some of the disputes that have been submitted for resolution under the convention, and I don't intend to duplicate that. Rather, I'd like to look at how the tribunals in these matters have been called on to engage with the convention itself. As a treaty, the convention has a number of particular features that, taken together, render it distinct. The number of parties is very large, the scope of the treaty is extraordinarily broad. Many aspects of the law of the sea are covered by other instruments or by organizations such as the FAO and the IMO. Anyone who has worked with the convention will tell you not all of its provisions are entirely clear on their face. There are quite a few drafting inconsistencies in places where the six authentic languages are not entirely in alignment. Despite the heroic work of the UNCLOS Drafting Committee, a final session of the third conference devoted purely to linguistic scrubbing probably would have been helpful, but was not possible. And the dispute resolution provisions are extremely broad and permit only limited reservations. Indeed, with the possible exception of the WTO system, the convention entails broader acceptance of binding dispute settlement and over a much broader range of subjects than any other multilateral treaty. And finally, there's no easy mechanism for states' parties to control the interpretation of the convention, except through practice. The result of this combination is that courts and tribunals hearing disputes relating to the law of the sea are not simply engaged in the resolution of particular disputes. They also play an outsized role in interpreting and maintaining the coherence of the convention itself. 
This was, of course, anticipated during the drafting of the convention and the reason behind its strong dispute resolution provisions. A real life example. The tribunal in the Chagos Marine Protected Area Arbitration was called on to interpret Article 2.3 of the convention, which simply states, sovereignty over the territorial sea is exercised subject to this convention and other rules of international law. But what does this actually mean? Is it a description? Is it an obligation? Can a Part 15 tribunal exercise jurisdiction over alleged breaches of such other rules? What to make of the fact that the parallel provisions on the exclusive economic uh, zone require only due regard, seeming to impose greater obligations on the areas where states are sovereign than where they only have sovereign rights. What to make of the fact that the English text seems descriptive while the other authentic languages suggest obligation. Now you may be thinking, so what? Tribunals interpret treaties. This is what they do. Uh, but rarely are tribunals called on to do so, so often and in such fundamental issues. Over and over again, Annex 7 tribunals, ITLOS, and the ICJ have been called on to grapple with the text of the convention itself. And I would argue that they have been largely successful in doing so, often with deep and persuasive analysis of the provisions in questions. Decisions across different bodies have built off of one another, and the practical implications of the convention are much clearer today than they were in 1994. The arbitral tribunal in Bangladesh, India, described the accumulated jurisprudence on maritime boundary delimitation as an acquis judiciaire on the provisions of the convention, an area where the accumulation of decisions and practice complements and builds on the law. I would suggest that a similar process is in fact playing out more broadly with the growing jurisprudence on the convention generally. And this phenomenon can be seen in international law as a whole. The accumulated jurisprudence of courts and tribunals makes dispute resolution safer and less uncertain. A hundred years ago, a state contemplating arbitration was taking a significant risk. It was not at all clear what international law on many issues was, or what exactly a tribunal might do in terms of procedure. States at the time accordingly sought to tightly control the process whenever they made recourse to arbitration. But the intervening development of jurisprudence and procedure makes recourse to arbitration or court far more predictable today. The same development is happening now with the law of the sea. This is healthy. Now, achieving consensus on a dispute resolution mechanism able to fulfill this role was not simple and required two key steps during the third UN conference. The first is the breadth of the dispute resolution procedures available under the convention. The convention requires states to accept procedures to resolve their disputes, but does not attempt to tell them how to do so. Instead, the convention favors the resolution of disputes as such offering a menu of procedures and a great deal of flexibility. And the second is the exceptions to binding dispute settlement and the non-binding alternatives that are created. Consensus requires permitting some exclusion of issues such as maritime boundary disputes from compulsory settlement and this required alternatives. And this brings me to my second point on the health of the convention and dispute resolution. The convention has successfully breathed new life into an old procedure in the form of conciliation. This is also healthy. As many of you are aware, in April 2016, Timor-Leste initiated compulsory conciliation proceedings against Australia under the convention in respect of the maritime boundary in the Timor Sea. Others here today will, I believe, speak to the substance of the proceedings, but I would like to note briefly what happened in the Timor Sea case and offer a few thoughts on what conciliation means in practice and what states should expect in considering the potential of this procedure. Now, for many in this room, I suspect that before the Timor Sea case, conciliation was mostly known as that untried procedure in the convention for when you don't have another option. A few perhaps remember the Yan Mayan proceedings of the early 1980s. But despite the shortage of recent experience, conciliation has a long history within the domain of public international law. Its intellectual genesis can be found in the evolution of the fact-finding procedures of commissions of inquiry in the early 20th century, the Dogger Bank proceedings of 1904, the dispute resolution procedures of the League of Nations, 
and the many bilateral treaties on the resolution of disputes concluded in the 1920s and 1930s. Compulsory conciliation is also provided for in the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, although its provisions have been sadly neglected. Throughout this history, the common elements of conciliation were the following. A neutral commission composed of individuals with expertise in the subject matter of the dispute. That the commission would engage with the parties and seek to understand the dispute and find an agreed resolution to it. That in the event that an agreement could not be reached, the commission would publish a report. And that the report would contain dis determinations of fact and such recommendations as the commission considered beneficial, but would not be binding. So what happened in the Timor Sea conciliation? From April 2016, intensive proceedings over the following two years included the formation of the commission in June 2016, a challenge by Australia to the commission's competence and a decision by the commission upholding its competence in September 2016, 11 distinct sessions of negotiations between the commission and both governments in Singapore, Copenhagen, Washington, Sydney, and Kuala Lumpur, high-level meetings between the commission and the political leadership of each government in Canberra and Dili, the initialing of a draft treaty on maritime boundaries in October 2017, a further six months of negotiation on the joint development of petroleum resources, the signature of the treaty on maritime boundaries in March 2018, the issuance of the commission's report thereafter, and the ratification of the treaty in August of this year. Now, I'm not going to go into the substance of the dispute over boundaries in the Timor Sea or the details of the party's ultimate agreement. One could easily spend several hours doing so, and in any case, the two governments have not made fully public the details of the legal positions taken during the proceedings. Confidence in the confidentiality of the conciliation process is essential for states to be able to take the risk of exploring potential agreements, and Timor-Leste and Australia agreed that significant parts of their discussions with the Commission will remain confidential. Instead, I'd like to offer three suggestions regarding what a state considering recourse to conciliation should expect. My first suggestion is that compulsory conciliation can have two very different modes, depending on whether the states are genuinely interested in finding an agreement. The convention makes conciliation compulsory in the sense that the process is obligatory, but there's no way to make an agreement compulsory. In the Timor Sea case, both Australia and Timor-Leste made clear to the commission that they did not simply want a report. They wanted help reaching an agreement. Accordingly, the commission engaged in what was, in many ways, a mediation meeting repeatedly with the parties on an ex parte basis, engaging in shuttle diplomacy, outlining potential agreements, and ultimately in assisting the parties to conclude the treaty. The Commission did publish a report, but it says nothing about the Commission's views on where the boundary should have been. That question was resolved by the parties' agreement. One can, however, easily imagine a conciliation proceeding that would have been entirely different. It is certainly possible that a respondent state brought to conciliation against its will will refuse to participate in the proceedings. Or they will participate in form, but grudgingly and with no intention of any compromise or real expectation of an agreement. Under such circumstances, I would expect that a conciliation would look much more like an arbitration, albeit with the commission ultimately delivering a set of substantive recommendations rather than an award. It is also possible that a maritime boundary conciliation may switch between these two modes exploring the possibility of, the agree of an agreement before ultimately preparing a report, or vice versa. The two modes are indeed complementary. The prospect of a recommendation from the Commission may well encourage the parties to redouble their efforts to find an agreement. And in the course of preparing a report, a Commission may well see avenues for a deal that it can productively raise with the parties. My second suggestion is that a conciliation may in fact be much harder and more involved for the state's concerned. An arbitration is comparatively simple. You make your submissions, you have a hearing, and you wait for the tribunal to come back with its decision. Now, you may or may not like what comes back, but there's relatively little for the parties to do in the latter phases of the proceedings. Not so with a conciliation, at least where both parties are fully engaged. There is much more. You still have to do all of the preparation to present and defend your position, 
but the parties remain fully engaged in crafting the ultimate result. In the Timor proceedings, the Commission engaged in essentially three solid months of meetings with the parties, far more than any arbitration. No result can be imposed, rather agreement needs to be built up. My third and last suggestion is that conciliation will likely involve a broader range of issues than any arbitration or judicial process. There's a well-developed body of law on the delimitation of maritime boundaries, and a quarter tribunal faced with a boundary dispute will be able to apply that law to delimit a boundary that is more or less predictable. But the reason that two states are unable to themselves agree on a boundary may or may not be closely related to the law. A tribunal will be limited to applying the law on the boundary unless the parties expressly agree that it may go beyond that. A conciliation commission, however, can fully explore the issues necessary to actually resolve the party's dispute. In closing, the health of the convention or any treaty is more than just dispute resolution. But dispute resolution plays a key role in maintaining the health of a treaty. And dispute resolution under the convention appears to be very healthy indeed. Thank you for your attention. And next, we'll hear from Davor Vidas. Thank you. It is really very good to be here. And thanks to the organizers for inviting me to, to speak here. I, um, well, I will add a few words to what this consilium of doctors the eminent legal colleagues already diagnosed about the health status of our Convention on the Law of the Sea. The Convention today appears to be in a rather good health. And this is so for many good reasons. It is supported by a number of ratifications and accessions, 168 so far. And even more so, it is confirmed through its prevailingly customary law status. It has a good track record. It functions. UNCLOS health, therefore, seems to be met with the happiness of many. We all know the negotiations took quite some time back in the 70s and early 80s, and those were not easy negotiations. And today, we have a strong young patient of 37 years, a very good age. And it is in its full force for the past 25 years. But here, I would not like to speak from the perspective of a family doctor or a physician of the Law of the Sea Convention. Rather, I would like to take the perspective of public health and would like us to think of the importance of prevention in keeping healthy. Public health, it has been defined as the science and the art of preventing disease, prolonging life, promoting health through organized efforts and informed choices. And it has been said that analyzing the threats is the basis of public health. We have been fortunate for the past 25 years, as all or most went well. But will this continue? How well are we equipped for the next 25 years, or even less than that? Looking at UNCLOS from that perspective, from public health perspective, we first wish to know whether there are any notable threats emerging on the horizon. And if so, what is their speed and what is their scale? and how serious it is. And most of all, what could we, as international lawyers, do to minimize the effects of threats or even to contain them? In other words, to keep Anglos healthy and functioning as long as this may be possible. 
let us then start with formulating our diagnosis. For this, we will look at the surrounding conditions first, before turning back to UNCLOS. We first need to look at the ocean itself, to see its complex interrelationships and interactions with the polar ice sheets and with the atmosphere. There is something unique happening out there. And this is, in the current speed and scale, going on in our own time. We do live in a very special time. To grasp this better, we must look at the ongoing change in very big proportions. In proportions which, not so long ago, the negotiators of UNCLOS or some other treaties were not in a need of thinking about. The reason for this is in that the horizon of political time, be it the horizon of several years or decades, if not centuries, was in a sharp distinction from what we understand as a geological time. The time of tens of thousands, millions, and even hundreds of millions of years, if not more. It happened, however, in the course of this time, the time that we are witnessing, that the politically relevant horizon of time has started to overlap and coincide with the time in its geological proportions, with a change of geological significance, but now compressed in a human scale time. This is unique so far. Findings regarding this change are getting more and more refined and are confirmed in many recent scientific reports, even those published a weeks ago. And the scale is quite big, even in geological proportions. It seems to be at the level of period, not only at the level of epoch. We now, as you know, live in the Quaternary period, which is colloquially known as the Ice Age, the past 2.6 million years. In the span of that time, also our species arrived. Well, the last 10% of it only. In all that time, the concentrations of atmospheric greenhouse gases, such as carbon dioxide, has not exceeded 500 parts per million. In May this year, the peak was 415. During the last 11,700 years, we live in an interglacial interval. It is called the Holocene Epoch, we know that. Over most of that time, CO2 levels remain stable between 260 and 280 parts per million. And the last past six to 7,000 years were a long period of relative environmental stability, distinct in all of the ice ages or the quaternary, the past 2.6 million years. So we've been blessed with stability. And now we are witnessing a tremendous, unprecedented change with acceleration, which began in the mid 20th century, but with the effects that are still delayed due to complex factors in the functioning of the Earth system. As to the proportions of that change, we are talking about, well, let me give you some examples. First, regarding the speed. From around 1950 to now, concentration of atmospheric CO2 rose from 210 parts per million to around 410 average of this year. That rise has happened in only 70 years. The last comparable rise of 100 parts per million, which was from 180 to 280 parts per million, occurred where the Holocene epoch began. But it took 8,000 years for this. So we are now over 100 times faster. This speed of rise is, according to the geologists, possibly without a geological precedent. Second, regarding the effects. The Earth system has considerable leads and lags 
between climate drivers and their effects, which depend on interaction between the atmosphere, the ocean, and the ice. The ocean has a delayed thermal response time. The reaction is coming, it is postponed. The example of sea level rise, that is the case in point, it is Ill inbuilt and it is partly inevitable. Third, regarding the scale, we are already now, as to greenhouse gases, not only beyond the norms of the Holocene epoch, 11,700 years of the past, but beyond the norms of the entire quaternary period of those 2.6 million years. And fourth, regarding the consequences, some of the most recent geological studies estimate that the climate parameters with business or as usual or alike will begin to, this, to resemble those characteristic of the Pliocene epoch, which was some three to five million years ago. And this already by between 2030 and 2040. But this is a frightening study, I must say. What makes a difference so far? What delays the full range of consequences? It is mainly the ocean. Its role as a buffer, a storage of heat. Is the health of the ocean the same as it was in 1982? Increasingly so, it is not. There are many symptoms. Take, for instance, ocean acidification, impacts on bio biosphere, less oxygenation of the oceans, to name only the few. Can Anclos remain healthy? In a longer term perspective, not likely. Why is this so? Well, think for a moment of Mare Liberum, the famous work of 66 pages, written by Hugo Grossius and published in 1609. It is often held that this is the beginning of the law of the sea as a scholarly discipline. Well, this can perhaps be debated, but what can't be debated is that there were 373 years between the publication of Mare Liberum in 1609 and the adoption of UNCLOS in 1982. Almost four centuries of important change. Those almost four centuries which separate the, uh, the UNCLOS from Mare Liberum were the time of immense change in any political, economic, or societal understanding. And in this respect, we can talk of a deep time. But in one other respect, which became obvious only in more recent years, the two are joined. They belong to the same time. Both Mare Liberum and the Convention are joined by being implicitly crafted for the relatively stable natural conditions of the Holocene, of the last Holocene, the last several thousand years. We are at present departing, and in various respects, we have already departed beyond the parameters of the Holocene. Those concentrations of atmospheric CO2 and methane are just some of the many symptoms. There is no time to speak further about the various implications for current international law of this change, a change which is already getting its geological name. But one implication must be mentioned in closing, and it must be emphasized. That is the overarching objective of UNCLOS, to facilitate the avoidance of conflicts and the maintenance of international peace and security. That is what our public health approach must be about. How do we, in public health vocabulary, prevent threats and prolong life of UNCLOS, and also promote its health through organized efforts and informed choices, as the definition reads. How, in other words, could we better incorporate new scientific findings into policy-making choices, and urgently so, 
And I think with this, my 12 minutes or 15 have expired. Thank you very much for your attention. So we have about uh, half an hour for questions, and uh, we're uh, happy to take any questions from the floor based on what you've heard. Yes. Yes, and good morning. Uh, Nila Matsuk, Luc uh, Kia University. Uh, my rather broad question for this panel would be, uh, what does it take to establish the health of the ocean and how to maintain it? So we've heard about uh, ocean assessments, which is clearly the factual basis upon which any kind of legal obligations um, uh, must, uh, where this must be rooted. But um, how would such assessments then be translated into duties to prevent more harm to the ocean? and duties to restore, to bring ocean health back to what we think is prudent or is a good level of um, health. Uh, my main question would rather be who is to establish such obligations in an abstract and in a concrete uh, manner. Would that be dispute settlement? I doubt so. Maybe if there has been an accident, yes, but not in a more general manner. Advisory opinions, those who know me know I'm a great fan of uh, advisory opinions, but would that be a way forward? Who would bring such uh, uh, requests? And uh, to whom would such obligations be owed? To other states' parties? To humanity? Or to the ocean as such? Thank you. Well, I think that the short answer to your question is um, all of the above. Uh, the, the what we're talking about is a regime, what uh, political scientists call a regime, which is rules, norms, and decision-making procedures that converge in a particular issue area. Um, what counts is state practice, and state practice can be shaped by dispute resolution advisory opinions. Uh, when you have a patchwork of customary rules, that can lead to a legislative process, which could be a treaty-making process. And at the treaty-making process, there is an allocation of duties. Um, so um, it's not just one step it's, or a big bang. It's a, um, a multiplicity of uh, contributing factors. Uh, what we've done here on this panel is to set forth um, what some of the elements are, and part of the assessment is obviously whether it's had a meaningful impact, and secondly, whether um, the rate of change in the water is actually moving faster than uh, normative steps uh, in the law. But with that, let me just ask my fellow panelists if they would like to comment. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you. And thank you for that question, which um, the questions. Well, let me start perhaps with the assessment part, because that was also something I addressed. Um, of course, I referred to the 2015 well, First World Ocean Assessment and uh, the findings therein. How, however, I can uh, also refer to an earlier assessment by the group of experts for the scientific aspects of marine environmental protection, which was entitled State of the environment back in the early 2000s where some of the same conclusions were already there. So we are getting more science um, and uh, of course we also have the second world ocean assessment which will be released next year. Um, we need to strengthen the science policy interface clearly because the science is already telling us very clearly what the state of our oceans is and has been telling us. Um, I have high hopes that um, policymakers will listen uh, uh, or will pay more attention to these findings. Um, well, for example, for the first uh, World Ocean Assessment, it was established by the general, um, the, under the regular process for global reporting and assessment of the state of the marine environment, a process which was established by the General Assembly, and its results go back directly to the General Assembly. Um, how do we restore the health of the ocean? Well, the solutions are well known to us. 
um, I would say we know what we need to do. That was also one of the findings from the first World Ocean Assessment, and I think reference has already been made to um, under international law, rights are accompanied by duties. Uh, so, but uh, clearly, um, I think we also need to engage a broader range of stakeholders. Uh, I made reference to the fact that we need to get the private sector more engaged. Um, and I think that is something where also we need to optimize on um, trying to get as many efforts uh, also in terms of capacity building and financial resources, excuse me. <clears throat> I think probably my colleagues will want to, uh, uh, fellow panel members will probably want to address some of the dispute settlement aspects. Well, just very quickly, I think um, dispute resolution with respect to environmental issues really is a, an untapped area of, of potential growth, both because the environmental provisions of the convention are so broad and, and because in, environmental issues are, are one of the areas where there essentially is no jurisdictional bar. Um, to compulsory dispute settlements under the convention, at least no subject matter specific bar. But of course, to use dispute resolution with that, you need a state willing to take up the, the cause. And, and initiating inter interstate dispute resolution um, provisions is it's time consuming, it messes up your diplomatic relationships, um, and generally, so far, what we've seen is that states that are specifically affected are willing to take those steps, but, but nobody is, is yet trying to, to leverage UNCLOS more broadly. Oh, it is. <laughs> Thank you very much, Nella, for this question, which, of course, is broad and fundamental. What do we do legally and specifically, in not only international law, but in the law of the sea? Well, let me take the your example which you know well and several of us are here who belong to the International Law Association Committee on International Law and Legal Rights. So the question of sea level rise I think is a good, good case in point because we know it is coming. We know this with confidence. We don't know how quick the acceleration will be, we don't know the amount, but we know it is inevitable to a certain extent and it will happen. We need measures for this. So to follow this public health approach which I have introduced, I think that we need two things. One is the quarantine, and the other is periodization of responses. And I think that we, this is what we are doing in this Committee on International Law and Sea Level Rise, and I see here David Friston is a core rapporteur who will know much better to present our, our proposals so far. But what we did is to divide responses into those which are shorter term, from those which are mid to longer term. And regarding shorter term responses, the resolution which the ILA has already adopted is the quarantine, basically. It says that, and I'm reading from Resolution 5, 2018 of the ILA, that on the grounds of legal certainty and stability, provided that the baselines and the outer limits of maritime zones of a coastal or an archipelagic state have been properly determined lawfully, basically, lawfully determined in accordance with UNCLOS. These baseline sea limits should not be required to be recalculated should sea level change affect the geographical reality of the coastline. And the same proposal has been made for maritime boundaries. But what does it mean? Will it last forever? It won't. This means that you have been put, that a legal solution has been put on hold or that the threat has been put in quarantine and what means short term? I don't think this is a, a time horizon. I think this is a, the factual change horizon. As long as the, this proposal or this solution would prevent conflicts and work towards the objective, ultimate objective of the Law of the Sea Convention, it will work and the quarantine will hold. But we have to use this time to, to think and elaborate also mid to long term measures which, will be, which must be different. Just building on what my colleagues have said, what Gabrielle said about uh, other stakeholders, uh, there's no reason why this issue is purely the domain of state-to-state -state, uh, arbitration or adjudication or conciliation. Uh, I just attended a conference with constitutional court judges from around the world, and every single one of them has faced a case uh, in their domestic courts, uh, often against private 
uh, greenhouse gas polluters about sea level rise. And the claim is that these companies have um, failed to disclose the impact of their activities on sea level rise and therefore states and localities and municipalities haven't had a chance to uh, mitigate um, or to uh, prevent themselves from having harm from uh, storms, etc. Obviously, also, this is the subject of other treaty regimes like uh, the Paris Climate Agreement, among others. So, um, in my academic uh, writings, I've written about a very complex process with multiple stakeholders uh, operating domestic and internationally, which I call transnational legal process. That's exactly what we are seeing playing out in this particular area. Yeah. Um, a follow-up question concerning the future role of courts, tribunals, and commissions. In light of the challenges that were described by Gabriel and Davor, um, and that were also mentioned in the remark by uh, Harold Coe concerning climate litigation. Um, when it comes to how we are going to tackle those apical challenges that were so um, strongly and correctly described by the speakers, the problem that often states are not simply not as still as the dominating actors in international relations not willing to do what they should do or what we think they should do. That's quite trivial, isn't it? And there is a tendency, I think, uh, that is going on for quite some years to try to make use of courts in order to overcome that dilemma. And that tendency can be seen and observed within national domestic jurisdictions, but maybe potentially also on the international plane. And some think this is an extremely good development, others take a more careful approach to that. Why? Because if courts, tribunals and commissions take a too active approach, maybe struggling with the limitations of their jurisdiction, then this may result in counter effects uh, essentially saying states may take an even more careful and reluctant approach or may even ultimately um, leave the regime concerned such as the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. So the question is how, how far can we make use of international and national courts as machinery in order to address the challenges described. I'd be simply be interested in, your, in the position of the speakers concerning this, I think, very important issue. Thanks. Thank you for that question. <laughs> Not an easy one. Um, I'm going to look through the environmental lens for a moment and um, just wondering, um, there hasn't really been, except for some isolated cases, uh, where one state has, um, uh, maybe at the regional level, yes, but where, where a state has uh, instigated proceedings against another state for not uh, complying with their obligations on the UNCLOS with respect to uh, Part 12 or any other provisions that are relating to the protection and preservation of the marine environment. And uh, I could uh, say that uh, it's perhaps not surprising because um, no state can really claim of itself that it is following or fully implementing UNCLOS. So I'm wondering whether that route is the most effective. Um, it hasn't yet seen. Uh, we know that in the case of uh, Colombia has done this. Uh, and also bringing in the human rights perspective, which of course is a very interesting one. Um, and I would expect that perhaps, now coming back to the point that was raised earlier, uh, that perhaps there's also a lot more stake where, where, where individuals can actually bring cases or groups of individuals and actually hold the state accountable for not uh, meeting its obligations. Uh, and also arguing more on the human rights component of that. Um, we may be actually going down that route. <laughs> uh, I would see in particular with respect to the impacts of climate change 
uh, where um, these are being felt much more really by, by, uh, by people uh, around the world, in particular, of course, um, I, small island developing states and also uh, low-lying coastal states. So uh, it may be the communities themselves that might actually try to explore how they can actually hold the states accountable. Um, so uh, yeah, maybe that's all I would like to say on that topic. Well, I think the president put it well in his remarks that um, courts are good at specifying in particular cases or controversies that there's been a duty that was breached um, and that that should then give rise <coughs> to a legal rule uh, that can be generalized through either legislation, executive action, treaty negotiation, or the like. And such rules are the precautionary principle, the duty to cooperate, uh, requirement of environmental impact assessment, due diligence, uh, et cetera. Um, or simply to clarify um, that uh, what the science is in a particular area. Um, the courts tend to impose limitations on their own ability to adjudicate based on use standy and uh, other principles of admissibility. So it's uh, rare that they go beyond the scope because they have their own limitations. Just, just to give some examples from the United States right now, um, the state of Rhode Island, which is a small state, which is about 40% uh, on the ocean, has filed lawsuits against five major fossil fuel companies making the simple claim that the fossil fuel companies knew of sea level rise. And at the exact moment when they themselves raised their oil platforms uh, offshore by 10 feet, they began to deny uh, climate change as a matter of science and publish ads against it. The, this is the exact same litigation that has been brought against tobacco companies and opioid manufacturers, et cetera. And the claim is there was a duty of disclosure that was breached. Um, one of the issues uh, going on also is uh, the case of our children's trust, where the claim is that the people who will be injured by climate change are people who are children now. So they're the ones who should have the right to sue. In the United States, this case, the Juliana case, has gone on for two and a half years, and it's still in a fairly preliminary stage. But the Supreme Court, our Supreme Court, which is very conservative, did not shut it down. So it's still proceeding. So uh, clearly, there's a role for all kinds of courts to play. Um, and that the, uh, this tribunal, as well as arbitral panels, can contribute to that on a state-to-state -state basis. The question reminds me a little bit of the argument that, that sometimes comes up in, in various um, arbitrations, um, I would imagine also uh, before the international courts of exceptions to jurisdiction. Should one construe them narrowly? Should one construe them broadly? Um, usually one state or the other will be arguing a particular view. And most of the tribunals have confronted with this question have said, well, it, it's not either. You construe them as they are. Um, I think the, the question of, of how broad should the role of courts and tribunals be is, is a little bit the same. Um, should they be you know, going far beyond the dispute to try to, to solve problems? No, but should they also be holding back on the jurisdiction that is there out of a fear of, of causing offense? I, I, I again would say no, and I would say that there, there are quite a few doctrines, as Harold mentioned, with respect to the need for an actual dispute um, that, that then serve to, to limit that. And um, I mean, are, are all states that have been involved in, in Annex 7 or other, other law Part 15 proceedings happy in the course? Of, of course they're not. I've had some very, very unhappy governments on my phone at different points in, in certain cases. Um, but by and large, insofar as that is leading to a discussion and a debate among different points of view within the terms of the convention, I think that's actually a healthy process. Thank you very much. Uh, probably I'm 
really the, la I'm the last to speak, and I'm probably the last one to speak about courts and judiciary. I'm admitted to this nice hall once in a 10 years. So, but um, from public health perspective, I think that for judiciary it will be, again, important prevention, practicing of legal prevention by states. Uh, solutions on which states are in agreement against the background of changing factual situation. I would like to add also that what is important is to know that also International Law Commission regarding the sea level rise is engaged on this issue as of recently and can build upon the studies already done and proposals already made by the International Law Association. So I think that also the role of scholarship is important in this prevention. The role of various segments of scholarship, like individuals, but also organizations like ILA, and then the state-sponsored scholarship within the International Law Commission. So we all have a role in this process, then turning to the judiciary. So. Um, I thought I might pick up on uh, Davor Vidas' uh, reference to Grotius and the uh, Mare Liberum. Um, and to ask whether part of what's happening with the kind of mismatch between how fast things are happening in the ocean and our current legal structures is, isn't whether we have kind of evolved beyond the whole notion of the freedom of the seas, that the freedom of the seas is essentially unsustainable at this point. Um, and I was thinking about that, particularly in light of the BBNJ negotiations, when there was early on substantial media attention and some NGO attention to the idea of simply banning high seas fishing. Um, and that would be kind of one manifestation of the idea that freedom of the seas has kind of outlived its, its time. And so I'd be interested, particularly in Davor, but also the, the rest of the panelists' views on that. Thank you. I think we should not blame Hugo Grossius to be the ideologist of globalization. He was, of course, but, but we, have, we did a lot of change in the past four centuries. So we have a very good architecture of zones, of rights and duties in various zones. And I think we will have, if we wish to keep UNCLOS healthy, we will have to maintain that for as long as possible. So it's a very short answer, but... Yeah. I think we're very far from Grotius in that uh, the issue addressed in the UNCLOS is not just freedom of the seas, but um, exploitation of resources uh, by designating areas that are exclusive economic zones, areas that are capable of deep seabed mining and then uh, assigning rights uh, to states, coastal states and others, to exploit those resources subject to certain limitations. And then as resources become more scarce, uh, they tend to operate further out. Um, I mean, we're facing also the astonishing uh, irony that um, as the uh, ice cap melts that um, you can sail further out than you could before and then you can look down and then you can exploit more fossil fuels from the uh, areas of the outer continental shelf that are exposed by the melting of the ice cap. So I think it's the exploitation of the resources uh, and the impact that that's having environmentally that's making this run faster than anything Grotius could have imagined. I don't think we had absolute freedom of the seas to start with. Certainly that's not what is in the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, which balances freedom of fishing with duties of conservation and management. And of course, these have been further elaborated on in the UN Fish Stocks Agreement. So um, on that score, I would, uh, and, and, and in respect of all of the freedoms, there are duties that also relate to the protection and preservation of the marine environment. So we had already, UNCLOS itself had already moved away from uh, Grotius. Um, and I would say that over the time, uh, the Bastillion of exclusive flag state jurisdiction has also slowly been chiseled away, and uh, more clearly because not only, and this is 
started particularly in the International Maritime Organization with first a voluntary audit scheme. Now we have a mandatory audit scheme and uh, slowly also in the area of fisheries uh, there are more and more um, attempts at trying to uh, ensure that um, there will be more accountability with respect to, flag, uh, to fishing vessels. So slowly but surely even that has whittled away and also of course in the area of uh, suppression of uh, crimes at sea. So um, yes, I would say that, that, and I see that that progression will uh, continue in particular in the area of fisheries where with the port state measures agreement, uh, the FAO port state control agreement and also within the context of the international uh, labor convention, the maritime labor convention uh, where we have more possibilities and, uh, to now also, and I should say, sorry, the fishing, um, I can't remember the exact name now, but uh, the, the uh, convention on um, also f uh, fishing uh, convention uh, that which allows for a control of uh, labor conditions uh, in port, uh, that these are very important uh, conventions as we move forward because one area that I would highlight that perhaps we haven't really addressed sufficiently is the social element uh, in UNCLOS. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> David Freestone, I'm the um, co-rapporteur of the ILA uh, Committee on International Law and Sea Level Rise, and as Dovor Vidas already pointed the finger at me, I feel obliged to stay, say something. I'm pleased, so thank you to the panel for some great presentations. Um, looking back at this as a, the, the health of UNCLOS as well as the health of the oceans themselves, I mean, there are other bodies that have responsibilities for looking at this, and I'm... Um, thinking particularly of the UN Triple C, which has you know a, a, a regime which has systematically ignored the oceans. Um, I'm hoping that the the, uh, the conference in Chile later this year, the, the so-called Blue COP, will start to look at this issue. But it it really is it's notable that when we've looked at litigation, for example, in relation to to things like sea level rise and to uh, impacts of climate change is really the law of the sea convention regime which we've been looking at. So I think that's a great tribute to the system. So what I wanted to do was to move forward. I mean, the, the, I, both Gabby and uh, Davo mentioned this horrendous report on the IPCC report on the oceans and the cryosphere, which is a really bleak story. Um, and it's an, uh, what I think is going <laughs> to talk about this a little bit tomorrow, but uh, they do actually point out some some policy things that we could do. One is the obvious one is reducing CO2 emissions, but also uh, systematic system or system, uh, comprehensive systems of protected areas, uh, which can actually provide some some form of uh, of mitigation of some of the, some of these activities. And we are now t moving towards the end of this BBNJ process. You gave us the full name, Gabby, and it's. It's longer even than the 1995 Fish Dogs Agreement, which ran to like seven lines, isn't the title. But the BBNJ Agreement is, some have said, this is perhaps the big opportunity of our lifetime to actually perhaps supplement, not, not to change the convention, the, uh, the, the UNCLOS itself, but to actually provide, if you like, future proofing, which the negotiators 30 years ago didn't actually see. So I, do you see BBNJ as an opportunity to actually for us to provide that sort of overarching policy issues which we seem to have been unable to um, uh, get to grips with so far? Thank you. Thank you for that question. And of course, I don't want to steal the thunder of the third panel. I'm looking at, <laughs> since you're also in that. Um, <clears throat> maybe just picking up on some of the things that you've said um, before turning to the future, the negotiations on the BBNJ, and I'm glad we're coming to a short title for that. Um, you said the UNFCCC has sort of ignored the ocean uh, issues. Um, I think the oceans have always been the big elephant in the room. <laughs> And uh, at the time uh, when the Paris Agreement was being negotiated, I think to take on the ocean pile would have been even more complex. Um, well, the oceans are making their presence known. I think the IPCC report, the results will be presented to the forthcoming UNFCCC COP. And so, uh, and there have already been um, 
I think a lot more uh, synergies uh, that are being established. Uh, we're very happy to have the UNFCCC Secretariat as a member of UN Oceans, as I mentioned, the interagency mechanism. So uh, we're certainly trying to also, in the framework of UN Oceans, have organized several events in order to also show the interrelationship between oceans and climate, which I think I've not necessarily always understood so well. Uh, but certainly, of course, the oceans have not only the function of uh, regulating climate, but also, of course, our big carbon sink. Uh, so uh, that is an intimate relationship and the importance of, and I think it's very important that UNFCCC <clears throat> perhaps also understands this. I don't think it's an issue uh, so much for the ocean community because we have been discussing the impact of climate change on oceans uh, in the level of the General Assembly and also had a special topic on this in the UN open-ended and formal consultative process. So I don't think it's a problem at the level of the ocean community, but it's important to understand this relationship more because of the importance of oceans as a carbon sink and the need to build resilience and the resilience needs to be, and you mentioned absolutely marine protected areas is of course one way of building that resilience, but obviously states need help and I will emphasize again the need for capacity building and the UNFCCC uh, financing mechanism certainly uh, establishing more of a synergy in that regard is, would be very important for the ocean community as they are building resilience and also coming up with uh, blue carbon, um, more mangrove forests, etc., etc., uh, uh, will be very critical. Uh, is this an issue for the BBNJ? Um, the issue of climate change has been raised in the discussions so far. Um, of course, the process is in the hands of states, but uh, it has been raised. It has been raised, and particularly also in the context of the discussions on environmental impact assessments and cumulative impacts. And uh, the um, draft uh, text um, that was before the uh, third session uh, has actually an article, uh, that, a draft article that relates to cumulative and transboundary impacts. So clearly climate change is very important in that context. But I will say that one thing that is a challenge, and it's more of a practical one, how do we actually have indicators? We don't have indicators, or we haven't yet managed to do that, for cumulative impacts. How are we going to assess progress? And that's not only just pertinent for areas beyond national jurisdictions, obviously also uh, important for areas within national jurisdictions. So there are also some scientific challenges where um, the science community needs to also adopt a more multidisciplinary approach in order to be able to uh, face the current challenge of dealing more with cumulative impacts. It's very difficult to isolate and say one issue is, uh, well, perhaps for fisheries, but for pollution, it's very difficult to isolate and target what is the particular uh, stressor uh, for any uh, in that regard. Thanks. Thank you, David, for introducing also the, the issue of interaction. And indeed, the Earth system functions through interaction in between the atmosphere, the oceans, and polar regions. And there has been recent and increasing change in that interaction. Then our legal regimes for the atmosphere, for oceans and polar regions, well, they have been largely crafted in a time marked by, by stability, by largest level of stability. Uh, and they have not been interrelated sufficiently. So I think that one, one area to look at and one big picture to look at is how better to interrelate those, those uh, not compartments, but parts of the system not only in natural earth system understanding, but, but now in legal understanding. This is where we will have to follow. And now you have uh, the Paris Agreement, which I think mentions oceans once, but in a preamble. <laughs> Thanks. So I wouldn't want to get into the, the substance of the BBNJ negotiations, except to, to stress that it's a state-driven process, which in this context I think is actually uh, quite important, and, and that relates a little bit to, to David's prior question about, well, is it time to end the, the freedom of the seas or make radical changes? And, and my reaction there, coming from the perspective of, of working with, with tribunals in, in applying the law, or endeavoring to apply the law, is that one of the sources of international law is not, it would be a good idea. Um, and to that extent, insofar as from the legal perspective, um, changes and developments are required, 
Um, that's something where, where states ultimately need to be engaged in, in what is ultimately their convention and, and their legal regime. And insofar as the BBNJ process is a state-driven process that can, can play into that, then I think that's quite useful. So I guess as a final comment, I, I think the, the point that Mr. Freestone made was very important, but it just flows out of the basic fact that the, the seas are only a tiny piece of this problem. And that um, therefore many UN bodies and specialized agencies need to get involved to address the overall issue. Davor has used the public health image the actual organization that's most relevant is actually the World Health Organization to address uh, non-communicable diseases and other things that are resulting. Just, just to give an example, the island of Kiribati in Micronesia, because of the gradual decay of the coral reefs, the fish are going away, and so they've started to uh, import processed foods, and uh, diabetes is way up, and uh, obesity is up, which is the number one non-communicable disease. So not only are, is that uh, tiny island nation facing the prospect of sinking into the ocean uh, within the next 10 years, but all of the residents are facing public health problems. And then when we also face the reality that uh, one of the best uh, solutions for uh, climate change apart from renewable energy is to reduce the uh, number of cows that are being eaten and that calls for development of plant-based foods which has now become a huge competitive game in the um, American and, and European um, uh, culinary uh, production markets. So all of these will be a critical factor I mean, I think it's not just using the image of public health for the oceans. It's actually become a central public health problem. Well, thank you all. We, we've had a very, I think, good start to the day's programs. And uh, we hope that this sets the stage for the discussions and keynotes that are to come. And thank you very much. And please give a round of applause to my fellow panelists. <laughs> 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 I'm <laughs> <laughs>